All right, go ahead and get started. So in this session, I'm essentially just going to give a review of what we covered between the first and the second exam. Uh, what I'd like to do is answer your questions first before I you know, just start ask, go, going through the material. Uh, but before I ask if there's any questions, uh, what you see on the screen is essentially the uh, list of topics or the roadmap for the second exam. This document is posted to our Canvas site under, I believe, the very last module. It's the exam to review module. Uh, it, you should also see a, uh, uh, a review there, or I believe, uh, oh, I take it back. It is the spring 2020 exam. Uh, the exam itself is going to be very similar to the, the first exam. It's going to consist of 25 questions, multiple choice. You're allowed one sheet of paper, front and back, however you want to write that. Uh, and you have one week to take the exam starting this Monday. Uh, you will need to use the lockdown browser, so please make sure that you are comfortable, comfortable with that. And uh, with that, I suppose I'll just ask if there's any questions. Fair enough. Ah, uh, someday, <laughs> someday there will be questions. <laughs> okay, so uh, the exam is gonna encompass uh, chapters five through eight. And so if you remember where we left off with the, uh, the first exam, Chapter five essentially started off with weighted average returns of portfolios. And it kind of went downhill from there, where we started talking about correlation coefficients, covariances, standard deviations, modern portfolio theory, uh, alpha and beta and cap M, and then finally market anomalies. Uh, so why don't we go through each of these? So first off, we have the weighted average return of portfolios. So I, I was thinking about how I wanted to do this, and I figured rather than just going over a couple of examples or questions from the, the spring exam, I thought it would just be better if I wrote some new questions, just so you have some additional material to study from. So let me throw up some potential questions or some uh, questions that might mimic the, the second exam. So let's say you have uh, a portfolio. We have two, we'll say three stocks. A, B, and C. And you have an initial investment of 1,000, 3,000, and 4,500 in each of these stocks. And we know the returns on each of these stocks. Let's say stock A, it's 22.3%, uh, negative 10.4%. and 5.2, 5 5.4%. Uh, can you calculate the weighted average return of these, uh, of a portfolio consisting of these investments with these returns? So uh, if you already know how to do this, fantastic. Uh, that should be free points on the exam. Uh, if you don't, well, first step when you see something like this, format this, there we go. Uh, first thing you need to know how to do is or is calculate the weights. So first thing we're going to do, and obviously you won't be able to do this in Excel uh, because you won't have access to Excel, but you're going to sum up the total investment. So we have $8,500 invested in these three stocks with these returns. And to calculate the weights of each of these stocks in our portfolio, all we're going to do is just divide our initial investment by our total investment. And put in here 8,500. We'll convert this to percentages. And I mean, you're essentially doing the same thing for stocks B and C. And here's our weights. Uh, to calculate the weighted average return, All you're, going, all you're going to do is just multiply your weights, so weight of stock A times the return of stock A, 
and then do the same thing for each of the stocks. So that is a very large number. So here we go. Uh, all I've done is just multiply the weight times the return. And then to get our weighted average return, we just sum up our weights times returns. Very basic. And in this case, our uh, average return, or our weighted average return, is 1.85%. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, shoot, that was easy. Uh, next, uh, benefits of diversification. Okay, so we talked about uh, diversification across industries and markets. The big benefit of diversification is that it allows you to identify assets, not necessarily stocks. These might be bonds, they might be commodities or currencies, Bitcoin, Yuan, Yen, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, Yen, uh, Euros, whatever. Uh, basically, being able to diver diversify across different assets gives you the opportunity to benefit when uh, one of those assets pays off and it exposes you or it diversifies your portfolio across a bunch of different assets so that if U.S. stocks or the stocks that you're holding in the United States, uh, let's say the value of those stocks fall, the other assets in your portfolio are might not be likely to fall in value. So the benefit of diversification is that you're, you're essentially reducing that, as I called it in the, the lecture videos, that uh, diversifiable risk, that firm specific risk. You're reducing it as a percentage of your total risk. And therefore, uh, when you do see these, these risk events that affect one asset, one stock, one commodity, you're not losing your the entire value of your portfolio because you're focused on one asset. Uh, so that's the big benefit of diversification across either industries or markets. You're you're exposed to various uh, various uh, well, different assets that aren't perfectly correlated. Uh, speaking of correlation, the reason we care so much about correlation is because if we can find two assets or many assets that are very lowly correlated or potentially, I mean, I, uh, ideally we'd want negatively correlated assets. If we can identify assets that are negatively correlated, that means when the value of one asset falls, the value of this other asset, which has negative correlation coefficient with asset A, is likely to rise. And in the extreme case, if we have a co correlation coefficient of negative one, what that means is whenever the value of asset A falls, the value of asset B will absolutely rise. And so if you had these two assets in a portfolio, you could build a portfolio with certain weights that would completely eliminate the volatility or the risk of ret the return risk. So the, the amount of jumping around that, that that portfolio return would do. Uh, so the, the more lowly correlated or rather the more negatively correlated, the closer the correlation coefficient is to negative one, the greater the benefit is to diversification. Uh, next, what is the efficient frontier? Okay, so the, the efficient frontier is, it's essentially a plotting of, actually, uh, it, it's essentially a plotting of the, <clears throat> uh, all of the possible combinations between standard deviation and uh, return that we could create in a portfolio with a bunch of different assets. So let me actually, Uh, pull up the, the lecture slides because I think that would that would really help show this uh, best. Hey, I didn't miss much, did I? Uh, I covered weighted average uh, returns or weighted portfolio returns. Okay. So if you're good on that, you're you're pretty good. Okay. Uh, so let's take a look at 
efficient frontier. So the efficient frontier is essentially everything, and I have a better chart of this, uh, it's everything on this blue line above the minimum variance portfolio. Remember, each of these dots and everything on this blue line, these represent portfolio combinations where we've adjusted the weights of all of the different assets in the portfolio. So for example, this point right here might represent the case where we have 100% of our portfolio in asset A and 0% of our portfolio in asset B. Uh, this point might represent the case where we have 100% uh, in asset B and 0% in asset A. But this blue line as the efficient frontier, this represents the highest possible return we could get if we wanted to accept each unit or each level of risk, aka volatility. Uh, so it, it essentially plots the best possible outcome for us. And our goal is to identify where on this efficient frontier we need to invest. What portfolio combination gives us the highest possible risk-adjusted return, aka the highest possible sharp ratio. And it's usually going to be somewhere right around here. Uh, there are other portfolios that we can create if we have more than two assets. And those are represented by those black dots right here. So these dots, because they're not on the efficient frontier, they indicate that uh, you can build a portfolio that has this return and this risk, but it's not going to be as efficient as, say, this portfolio right here with the same return, but less risk. So the goal of the modern portfolio theory is to identify the portfolio combination that has the highest risk-adjusted return, the highest sharp ratio. So uh, that's that. Uh, so what I just described, determining where we want to invest on this efficient frontier, this is step one of the modern portfolio theory. Uh, when we start to talk about risk aversion, that's where we get into step two of the modern portfolio theory. And to illustrate that, let me show you the, if I go down here further, I'll show you the full thing. So risk aversion is, it's, it's personal to, every, to each individual. Every different individual is going to have a, a specific level or coefficient of risk aversion. And uh, we, we use that coefficient of risk aversion A to model and determine how much utility we derive from a certain portfolio. So for example, I know personally that I'm, I'm pretty risk averse as an investor. I mean, if I have these four choices of stocks or assets that all have the same sharp ratio, I mean, I'm probably taking or investing in the small cap stock, even though it has the same sharp ratio as the large cap stock and the distressed stock, and the distressed stock offers the higher return. Essentially, your coefficient of risk aversion, uh, it determines how much risk you're willing to take and how negatively you value risk. If you're very risk averse, you shy away from, uh, from risk. And so, uh, what we do with the second step of modern portfolio theory is we identify your coefficient of risk aversion and then use the efficient frontier or the point on the efficient frontier that we identify to be the most efficient point. And then we essentially plot this. So this is kind of the final graph of the modern portfolio theory. So we found a point which would be right here, uh, which is the most efficient portfolio. Uh, so this has a certain portfolio weights, maybe 35% in one asset and 65% in another asset. And we've drawn a line, this red line, this is our capital allocation line. It represents just a straight line from our risk-free rate all the way to, to run tangent with our, our uh, ideal portfolio combination. And then in stage two of the modern portfolio theory, 
we use that that utility function that I just showed you uh, right here, and we plug in the return on the portfolio and the standard deviation of our our portfolio, or sorry, our variance of our portfolio and our coefficient of risk aversion, and this will tell us how much utility we've derived. Uh, but basically, our goal is to find somewhere on this ca uh, capital allocation line that maximizes our utility. So these, these lines, this yellowish line, the bluish line, the green line, and the gray line, these are what we call indifference curves. They represent curves on which every point has the same utility, or you have the same utility if you're on any point in this line. So for example, with the blue line, you're, you have utility of 0.05. Uh, so this would be likely our, our best utility curve that we could reach. And this means that the most utility that we could derive if we had a specific coefficient of risk aversion and we had these portfolio combinations, represented by our efficient frontier, this is the maximum utility that we could derive from our portfolio of risky stocks and a risk-free asset. And the modern portfolio theory, essentially what we're doing is we're using the expected returns of stocks, the standard deviations of stocks, the uh, risk-free rate, and uh, correlations and our coefficient of risk aversion to identify this this point right here that tells us the maximum amount of uh, utility that we can derive from our portfolio of risky stocks and uh, risk-free assets. That makes any sense. Okay. Uh, well, if you guys have any questions, I mean, please feel free to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, well, I just got one of them, but. First off, will we have like any questions where like we see a graph like this and then we have to like calculate the utility based off of the curves and everything or? Oh, oh, uh, oh no. Uh, so uh, you won't be asked to use any Excel on the exam. And you also, I mean, the best case scenario, or I guess I shouldn't say best care, best case scenario, but uh, the uh, at most, I'll ask you to, you know, give me a sense of what is the efficient frontier and, uh, you know, what, what are we looking for? Where are we trying to uh, get to on the efficient frontier? Uh, what do indifference curves represent? Uh, what is the capital allocation line? Uh, yeah, you, you, you won't see any graphs on the, the exam. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I think on one of like our like the weekly quiz for this there's like a question where it was like which one of these do we not need for like modern portfolio theory or for like certain kinds of analysis will there be like questions like that do you think uh there there might be oh, okay. uh when i when i do ask questions like that i mean I'll, I'll be very blunt uh i literally just go to say uh a slide so if you see any any uh, slide in chapters five through eight, and it's got like, here's three reasons why repurchases are undertaken. Well, you, well, given that there could be four answer choices, you, you could probably expect that, uh, you know, which of these is not a, a common reason why repurchases are undertaken. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to try and make those fairly obvious if I can. Okay, yeah, and then like going back, I know I didn't get a chance to ask this early, but, but when you're talking about like benefits of diversification, so like I remember one of our questions were like, which one of these are not like a risk of like international markets, like those kind of questions where it was like pulled right from the slides? I, I think, yeah, I mean, in those kind of questions, I mean, I know I've thrown, I mean, what are we looking at, 52 slides here, I mean, we're in, I mean, we're probably 200 and some odd slides-ish over the course of five chapters, five, six, seven, and eight. So 
I, I mean, I'm going to try and stay extremely close to what you've seen in the videos and the slides. Okay. Um, I'm not going to try and get away from that too much. And uh, I mean, short of asking maybe 35%, maybe 40% quantitative questions, uh, the, the qualitative questions, I, I want to be fairly straightforward and I want them to be questions that, you know, shown up in class, uh, you, you should have heard, heard the answer at least two or three times, if that makes any sense. Yep. Yeah. Hit, hit the stuff I already hit, I guess. Yep. Cool. Let's see where we're at. Uh, yes. Uh, so after the modern portfolio theory, we start to talk about, uh, well, actually, I'll just show you the, try and get my mileage out of this because I spent so much time trying to build this thing. But uh, sorry, I need the other slides. Uh, but once we get past the first half of the week five material or chapter five material, then we start to discuss the uh, cap M material. And the cap M material, there are many assumptions related to cap M. I mean, quite frankly, I, I guess I should say everything is fair game, but I, I probably will not be asking you, you know, what assumptions is cap M built on? Uh, but the reason we, we don't really, after you know, week five in this class, tend to focus too much on modern portfolio theory is because we're generally assuming that we are building a diversified portfolio. And once we just assume that we're building a diversified portfolio, what ends up happening is we stop caring about the standard deviation of our portfolio so much as the undiversifiable risk, or the, as it's often known, the market risk of our portfolio. And so this means that we start caring more about beta, which is our measure of market risk or undiversifiable risk, more so than we do standard deviation. And so that's why the, the capital asset pricing model is so important. It's because it, the capital asset pricing model essentially says that uh, the higher a firm's market risk or uh, beta, the higher the expected return on that stock. So here's our, our cap M in what we call the model form, essentially, our expected return on a stock, we'll call it stock I, is equal to the risk-free rate. Uh, so that's usually the, the yield on a treasury, a US treasury bill, plus our beta, our measure of systematic or market risk, times the expected return on the market, which we often use uh, the S&P 500 return to proxy for, minus the risk-free rate. And all of this is referred to as the market risk premium. Uh, so the higher the beta or higher the, the firm's market risk, the higher the expected return should be. Because it's, I mean, if a firm has a really high beta, this would be indicative of a cyclical stock. Uh, so for example, an airline company uh, that does really well when everybody has disposable income, but does really poorly when there's, let's say, a coronavirus outbreak or a recession. <laughs> Nobody wants to fly. Uh, Stocks with low betas will be stocks of companies that sell goods that everybody needs, no matter where we are in the business cycle. So for example, uh, Walmart, Kroger, uh, WD-40 I mentioned in class. Basically all of these companies, I mean, they sell stocks, they sell products that everybody needs at all periods of time. You're not gonna go hungry. You're gonna go to Walmart and buy food. So Walmart, their betas, I think like 0.25 right now. Uh, and that indi it indicates they're, they have a low level of market risk and they should have a very low expected return. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so I guess I just talked about uh, beta and why it's so important. Basically, you know, we, if we're assuming we're building a diversified portfolio, beta is our primary measure of, uh, of risk. Alpha, that's our measure of outperformance of an asset or a portfolio. So
Oh, I'm muted. That's a while. I didn't know that. Sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you have a question? Or... Um, could you just repeat that um, one more time? The last two things that you said about alpha and beta. That oh yeah. Beta uh, was... So beta, because we we generally assume that we're building a diversified portfolio of say 20 stocks or 50 stocks or a large number of stocks. We don't really care so much about the, the complete or the total standard deviation of our portfolio. Rather, what financial theory essentially tells us is that the factor that matters the most is market risk or our stock's exposure to the market. And our primary exposure our measure of market risk of our stocks is beta. So essentially, that's what we should be caring about is beta when we, uh, when we try to assess the risk of our portfolio. Alpha, on the other hand, this is the amount by which our stock or our portfolio outperforms the market based on what that model form of the CAPM says our stock or portfolio should have earned. So I, I think uh, this would probably be the best way I can graphically show what alpha is. So this line right here, uh, this is our security market line. It plots the capital asset pricing models uh, expected return or the relationship between expected return and beta. So beta is on the x-axis and the higher the beta, the higher the expected return of the stock. Uh, now these dots that are away from the line, these represent the actual returns of individual stocks. And so what you have here in this case, uh, for stock K, this stock is predicted to have a, an expected return right here on the security market line, but its actual return is down here. It's lower than the expected return. And what that means is that this stock had a negative alpha. It, this indicates that the stock underperformed what the model form of the CAPM said this stock should have had in terms of a return. Uh, this point right here indicates that this stock, whatever it is, outperformed the market and has a positive alpha. Uh, so this is why we care so much about alpha or uh, trying to identify stocks or put together portfolios that have positive alpha. It's because what we're really trying to identify is stocks that outperform the market. Uh, alpha is right up there with the sharp ratio in that it's, it's kind of our, our second best or one of our best measures of the performance of a stock or a portfolio. So I know I didn't really cover uh, this full term in uh, this class, but uh, Jensen's alpha, I mean, this is our, our primary measure of portfolio alpha. Uh, but alpha in general, we want it to be positive. Uh, so I, I did just mention the, the model form of the CAPM. Uh, this, what you're looking at right now, this is our regression form of the CAPM. And this is the form that we use when we, when we want to calculate alpha and beta. So at if you remember from class, we actually went through and we calculated alpha and beta using simple linear uh, regression. And uh, theoretically, if the cap M perfectly predicts stock returns or excess returns, what this should indicate, I mean, I guess I have this question right here. What this indicates is that alpha should be equal to zero. If the cap M is perfectly true and it perfectly predicts stock returns, then our alphas will always be equal to zero, indicating that this factor, the market risk premium, and our stock's exposure to the market, aka beta, perfectly predict the expected return or the excess return on our stock. That's a very important relationship. All right, so that's that. Uh, what is the security market line or SML? Well, that's just that graphical representation between beta and the expected return on a stock. So this line right here, I mean, all it really says is higher beta equals higher expected stock return. Uh, let's see, 
how do we determine whether a stock or portfolio has outperformed the market? Well, I mean, there's many ways that we do this, but in this class, I primarily mentioned in, well, at least in this chapter, we look at the alpha. If the alpha of this stock or this portfolio is positive, we say that this stock or this portfolio outperformed the market, meaning it outperformed what our model of stock returns said this stock or predicted this stock would have in terms of a return. Its actual return was higher than its expected stock return. Okay, uh, what issues and assumptions do we have with the CAPM? Uh, well, we have a lot. <laughs> there, there are uh, just a massive number of problems with the CAPM. Uh, the first one is probably the most important. It's sometimes referred to as Rolls critique, named after this uh, famous financial economist, uh, Richard Roll. And it essentially says, and we'll, I'll mention this in our chapter nine material here next week, but it essentially says that if we can't truly observe the market portfolio, then we can't ever know if the CAPM, our primary measure of predicting stock returns, is accurate or not. And the reason this is important is because uh, if you remember in class, we use the return on the S&P 500 as a proxy for the market. Well, the S&P 500, as you know, a lot of non-economists have been saying in the last week or so as we get closer to the election, the S&P 500, it's not the overall market. It's really just the value of U.S. equities, and in many cases, you could argue just large cap equities of publicly traded stocks. I mean, it doesn't capture the uh, value of bonds. It doesn't capture the value of currency or art or uh, other assets that we should capture if we wanted to perfectly capture the total market. And because we don't have a good measure for the overall market, we can't ever say that the CAPM uh, fails as a, a stock prediction model or it's, it's very good because we, we just don't have the tools to be able to use it properly. Uh, that's the big, the one of the biggest concerns with the CAPM. Uh, there are a lot of other concerns, uh, so it does make a lot of assumptions. Uh, so, for example, it makes the assumption that you can short securities. Sometimes you can't short securities uh, in certain markets. You can't short securities. So, I mean, I, I think I mentioned in class uh, for a long time you couldn't short Chinese securities or stocks. Uh, beta could be time varying. It depends. I mean, uh, beta. It might not be the only measure of risk. Uh, there might be other risk factors that investors have priced in. And uh, if one stock has another risk factor that it's exposed to, investors might uh, not want to hold that, that stock if it has too much of that type of risk. Uh, and then also, if you remember, I mean, this is probably the easiest problem with the CAPM to see. If you remember when we calculated the, the betas ourselves, we used historical data, five years of, or of monthly stock return data to calculate the beta. So we, we had a historical beta, but the historical beta might not be equal to the beta of today. I mean, if the firm has changed its operations, maybe it has all new suppliers or all new buyers, maybe its, its exposure to the market has changed. So there's I mean, there's just all kinds of problems with the CAPM. Uh, yeah. Oh, and then, uh, well, if you want to go through Black, Jensen, and Scholes, uh, basically stocks with high betas underperform, and stocks with low betas, they offer much higher returns than would be expected. Okay, uh, last part, market anomalies. And market anomalies, Basically, any if you can sort on a factor, if you can sort stocks based on one characteristic, like book price divided by market price of its stock, or the firm's market capitalization, or natural log of market capitalization, or the, the stock's historical stock return, or its bid-ask spread, if you can sort stocks in based on one characteristic, and you find that the stocks with 
a high amount of this characteristic or a low amount of this characteristic have alphas that are different from zero, you have found a market anomaly. The CAPM says you should not be able to sort stocks based on any particular characteristic and identify positive or negative alphas consistently. But in the real world, I mean, in financial research, we have found a massive number of anomalies. If you want to click the link here, you can see a list of them. I mean, I have really the, the top five most important ones over the last 40 years uh, for, for you here, the book, the market anomaly, the size anomaly, momentum, liquidity. Uh, basically, these anomalies, what they indicate is that there is a either a positive or a negative relationship between some characteristic that's not beta and stock returns. So for example, if we sort stocks based on the bid-ask spread of the stock and look at their returns, notice here that there's it's not quite a linear relationship. I mean, there's there's some a slight curve here in the original data uh, from this paper, but you can see there's a positive relationship between bid-ask spread and returns, which the CAPM says there shouldn't be. And so what we have here is the famous illiquidity anomaly. Stocks that are more illiquid, meaning they have higher bid-ask spreads, also have higher returns. And so this is, this is a direct contradiction to uh, the CAPM. So if you're looking for something that would contradict the CAPM, that's it. That's, that's absolutely our best uh, way to say that. If there's an anomaly, well, here's some pretty good evidence. The CAPM might not hold up. Cool. Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, chapter six, I think was a little more straightforward. I mean, we had a lot fewer videos for chapter six. Uh, you should know some of the pros and cons of stock ownership. So you get uh, generally a say in the uh, the voting of the firm. Uh, you get you're entitled to some cash flows of the firm. Uh, I mean, I think I had like a slide designated or uh, dealing specifically with this. Uh, you should also know that stock returns are higher than, or the average stock return over the course of the last 80 years has been higher than the average bond return, which is higher than the average return on uh, US government securities. Uh, this indicates that stocks are riskier and they correspondingly offer higher returns because investors demand a higher return if they're gonna invest in some asset that is more risky. Okay, uh, you should also know something about the, uh, some of the big events in the life of a stock. So uh, for example, you should, at this point, know what an IPO is. Uh, you should know what a stock split is. So that's what happens when a stock, uh, let's say, we'll give you, I mean, I know I mentioned this in class, but Apple and uh, Tesla, they both split their shares over the course of the semester. So Apple, I believe, undertook a four for one share split, which means that uh, prior, on the day prior to the split, if you had one share that was worth $100, after the split, now you have four shares that are each worth $25. So the value of your investment isn't changing. It just means that you have more shares. So a four for one split means your one share became four shares worth a fourth as much. And uh, the reason that firms do this is because sometimes their share price gets too high for investors to buy round lots of lots of 100 shares of. So they'll split their shares to make their shares more affordable. And the reverse is also true. I mean, you can have reverse share splits, which occurs when, let's say the share price is too low. So eventually I would suspect that Ford might split or undertake a, a reverse split because its share price is getting pretty close to the, uh, the minimum price on the, the New York Stock Exchange to be listed, and I believe that's $3. If it gets too close to that $3 range, I would expect Ford would engage in a reverse split and merge, say, two shares. If you had two shares of stock prior to the reverse stock split, now you have one share, 
and it's worth twice as much. Uh, so I mean, you're not changing the total value of your investment, you're just changing the number of shares that you have for that investment. Uh, spinoffs, spinoffs occur, oh, oh please go ahead. Um, does a, um, <clears throat> a reverse stock split mean that the company per se is doing bad? Like, you know how, um, um, like if a firm stops a dividend, it's like an automatic sign to pull your um, investments out and that they're going down. Um, is a reverse stock split along that line or is it just like something that they do to make the prices look better on the market? Uh, it's, it's a little of both. I mean, you don't really, see, I mean, there's far fewer reverse stock splits than there are stock splits. And I mean, most of them really occur once you get down into that uh, $10 per share or lower range. And I think most of the reason for reverse stock splits is to avoid getting delisted uh, by the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, because getting delisted means that hey, now, now your shareholders, if they want to sell their shares, it's, I mean, you have to, the, well, first off, those shares don't trade on an actual exchange. I mean, your broker has to go out and find some other investor themselves who's willing to say buy or sell your buy your shares or sell you certain shares. I mean, it's essentially the transaction costs go way up when shares get delisted and it's very bad press for the firm. So the firm, they absolutely want to avoid that. Uh, Spinoffs. This occurs when a company gets too diversified. So I think I gave a couple examples in class. I mean, I, I think I mentioned General Electric or sorry, uh, yeah, General Electric in class. And I mentioned that this is for a long time, GE was the quintessential uh, 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 conglomerate. So a conglomerate is a company that has a lot of different units that operate in a bunch of different sectors. So GE had a banking unit and an insurance unit and a power unit and a, uh, and a turbine unit. I mean, it had all these different units and I mean, it didn't have a lot of expertise in, in each of those units. So uh, when their CEO was replaced, their new CEO came in and began a campaign to uh, streamline the firm, get it back to power generation, which is its original focus. Uh, so they started selling off assets of the company. They started spinning off assets of the company and turning them into new standalone firms. And I mean, that's what spinoffs do. They allow a company to get rid of some assets and focus their time and their energy on what's really important to the company. And the spinoff, the, the spun off company, that's a standalone en entity. I mean, if you, prior to the spinoff, if you own shares of, let's say, Yum Brands, uh, after the spinoff, where Yum Brands spun off their Chinese operations, now you own shares of both Yum Brands and Yum Brands China. So you own shares of two distinct companies. Uh, so I, I think I mentioned that one in class. I, to this day, I'm still a shareholder of Yum and Yum China. Uh, and it allows both of those uh, CEOs to focus on what's you know, something that they have a, a very good understanding of the market. for. And then finally, repurchases. And repurchases, I mean, these are, in terms of uh, ways to return cash to shareholders, repurchases are the biggest way that firms repurchase cash to shareholders. And uh, they do this, I mean, they set, they do this in a couple of different ways. I mean, the most common way that firms repurchase shares is they go out on the open market and they buy back their own shares on the open market. Uh, but they can, they have a number of different other reasons why they might repurchase their shares. And I mean, if I was looking for a, a good question, which of the following is not a reason to repurchase shares? I mean, this, or a question, which of these is not a, uh, true based on what we talked about? This would probably be a, a good question to, to ask about, in my opinion. Uh, but basically, there's, I mean, there's several reasons why firms repurchase stock. And you know, I was hoping to find, oh, yeah, here we go. 
Uh, first off, they might believe that their stock is undervalued. So, I mean, it's if I know as the CEO of my firm that my stock is undervalued and I have cash on hand and I've got no good investment opportunities, why wouldn't I buy back my, my own shares? That means in the future, I don't have to pay out dividends to as many shares and the dividend per share can be larger uh, in the future. Also, if the firm has excess cash on hand and it's got nowhere to park that cash, yeah, let's, let's just return it to investors. And then finally, I mentioned green mail in this class when we talked about uh, repurchases. And I, I mentioned that there are some hedge fund investors, or private equity investors that will engage in tender offers and try, try hostile takeovers where they, they try to buy up a majority stake in the company. And one of the ways a company defends against that hostile takeover is to literally engage in what's called a uh, a targeted repurchase where the firm literally buys back the shares that this, this hedge fund manager or this equity uh, private equity manager has, uh, has purchased and they pay a premium to get this, this hostile uh, investor to go away. So repurchases prevent takeovers in some, in some cases. Oh, and then uh, dividends. I mean, I guess I, should mention this. Uh, I know uh, I mentioned dividends uh, several times when we got to chapter six, but the big thing with dividends is that they are signals. And when I say they're signals, if we see some new information about the firm, let's say the firm's uh, the firm announces that it's going to institute a dividend, I mean, hands down, Dividends are some of the strongest signals as to the, the future growth prospects or the future cash flow of the firm. When a firm, when its CEO or its board announces that the firm is going to initiate a dividend, that is the firm telling us as investors that firm is going to have enough cash flow to continue to pay that dividend off into perpetuity, forever, potentially. If we see that the firm announces that they're cutting the dividend, or omitting the dividend, that's a horrible negative signal. And it indicates that the, firm, the firm's management and board don't believe that the firm is going to have the necessary cash to continue to pay that dividend. So, I mean, I showed this chart in class, but I mean, there's a hugely, a very large negative response when firms omit dividends and a positive response when uh, to uh, initiations of dividends. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, what factors influence the dividend? Well, there there are several factors that influence the dividend. I mean, I have the the big four here. I mean, basically, profitable firms are more likely to pay dividends. Go figure. They have the cash on hand to do it. Uh, firms with low growth prospects, and this I think I I mentioned in class. This is probably counterintuitive, but it's the firms that are in mature industries with low growth prospects that are actually more likely to pay dividends because they don't have good capital budgeting projects that offer higher returns that they can really invest in. So rather than, let's say, engaging in a capital budgeting project that potentially has a, a very small NPV or a very low IRR, why not just return the cash to shareholders and have them invest in some other company that has higher growth prospects? Uh, and we also know that future profitability that determines or that that is indicative of dividends. So higher future profitability, uh, those firms are more likely to pay dividends. And then finally, there are some loan agreements, uh, bond agreements, or uh, if a firm gets a loan from a bank that will come with what are called debt covenants. And those covenants, in in a lot of cases, will specifically say this firm is not allowed to pay a dividend while this loan is outstanding. I mean, heck, I saw this, uh, I was looking at some data the other day and I, I came across a data set that, I mean, literally had all of the, an, in, an indicator variable for which loans actually had that indicator or which loans specifically said, this firm is not allowed to pay a dividend while the loan is outstanding. I mean, a large number of loans restrict the borrower from issuing dividends. 
Okay, uh, so that's that. Uh, you should also know something about, I mean, income stocks or stocks that pay dividends, growth stocks or stocks that have high market to book ratios, or if you want to think of it this way, low book to market ratios. Speculative stocks, I gave you two examples in class, pharmaceutical firms and penny stocks. These are stocks, these are the most risky stocks. Uh, cyclical stocks, I define these in class as stocks with a beta of greater than one. Defensive stocks, these are stocks like Walmart or Kroger that have a beta of less than one. Value stocks, these are the stocks that have high book to market ratios, meaning that uh, potentially these stocks are undervalued. Uh, large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, small cap stocks, these are definitions based on the, the market capitalization of the firm. So large cap indicates a market cap of, I believe, greater than 10 billion. Mid cap is anywhere from about 2 billion to 10 billion. And small cap is, I mean, really anything from about 500 million to 2 billion. Anything below about 500 million would be considered micro cap. Uh, and then blue chip stocks are just stocks of companies that everyone recognizes. Okay. Uh, chapter seven. Uh, so chapter seven dealt with uh, security analysis, and I, I think I mentioned this in class, but I, I'll just get it on the record now. I, with maybe one or two exceptions, I probably will not ask you to calculate ratios. I mean, there was one ratio in the assignment. Uh, if you want to potentially get a sense of what I'm, what I might ask you about. Uh, that I did ask you to calculate, uh, but I mean, most ratios, it's it's literally a, I mean, divide this number by this number. I mean, it's not exactly rocket science. So the more important consideration is interpretation. Can, if I give you a series of ratios for, let's say, four firms, can you interpret the data? Can you interpret, well, based on these ratios, this firm uh, is the most illiquid, this firm is the most highly levered, uh, this firm, based on its, I don't know, let's say its ROE is the most profitable. Uh, I mean, basically, can I, if I give you some data, can you identify uh, which firm is which? I, I, I'll try not to give too much away, but I, I think that that's the best I can say in terms of like, uh, if, if you're looking for a good example, definitely the, the assignment for chapter seven uh, is, is going to be very similar to what you, you might see on the exam, especially when I was asking you about the, the auto manufacturing firms. Okay, uh, what factors are, oh, uh, what is security analysis and why is it important? Okay, so the security analysis is exactly what it sounds like. We analyze individual securities using, uh, I mean, a variety of fundamentals. So. Uh, in chapter seven, I gave you a breakdown of the top-down investing approach, where we, we start out with macroeconomic analysis, and to undertake macro, well, well, in macroeconomic analysis, we identify the markets we want to invest in, and then in industry analysis, we identify the industries in those good markets that we want to invest in, and then finally, in security analysis, we look at the individual securities or assets, stocks in those industries that we want to invest in. So security analysis means that we're, we're literally looking at the characteristics of those individual stocks or other assets, if you want to uh, be specific. Uh, let's, so that's, I mean, that's the top-down approach in a nutshell. Uh, let's start with macroeconomic analysis. Uh, I mean, you should have gotten a sense of uh, the, the big leading indicators that we care about in macroeconomic analysis. Uh, so the, the most important indicator is likely going to be, I, mean, I guess we have a few, but the GDP growth rate. We don't want to be investing in a company or countries that have a very, very negative GDP growth rate. I think I showed you the data uh, currently, and I think Libya had a GDP growth rate of like negative 67%, which indicates, I mean, that was obviously a red flag because Libya is in the midst of, I mean, it, if it's not still considered a civil war, it's, I mean, it's extreme economic crisis. 
you wouldn't want to invest in that in that country. You saw that. Uh, another good indicator of market conditions is the LEI, the leading economic index. And uh, the LEI, the reason that's important is because this is an index of 10 of our most useful leading economic indicators. I mean, it, it really is, if we're looking for something that is a good predictor of future economic conditions in a market, this is going to be one of our best. And unfortunately, we only have it for about 15 to 20 different markets. But just to indicate, or I'll, I'll show you what's in this. Okay, so I talked about change in GDP. All of these things are very important when we're undertaking macroeconomic analysis. But here's our LEI. Here's the 10 components that go into it. Uh, all of them have been identified as leading indicators, meaning that they predict future economic activity. So for example, if we see that the average weekly hours of manufacturing increases, what that would indicate is that manufacturers have identified that they're going to be able to sell more of their, their inventory. So that's why they're increasing manufacturing. So if that goes up, that indicates that chances are there's there's going to be more more individuals or B two B buyers buying those products, whatever they are. Other things like building permits. I mean, if the number of building permits goes up. That means that real estate investors or developers have identified that there is a, a need or a demand for those houses or apartment complexes. So that that's why they're building them. Uh, so. The LEI, I mean, it's it's just an index that if it's positive or rather if the change is positive, that indicates that uh, future economic conditions should be good. I mean, we care about the change in the LEI more than anything else with respect to the LEI. If the change is positive, that's good. Change is bad, you might consider uh, maybe reducing your, your exposure to that market. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, are there any drawbacks to relying on international statistics? Yes. So the big drawback to uh, relying on international statistics is that if you're not getting, I mean, if you're not getting those statistics from a reliable source, chances are they could be inflated or underreported. So I, I think I gave a couple of examples in the lecture video. I mean, we could use all kinds of real world examples. I mean, for years, I mean, China has inflated its statistics, uh, usually at the, the, uh, pro the provincial level. Uh, a lot of countries have been caught inflating their statistics or in some cases, uh, reducing their statistics. So for example, the country of Greece, they underreported their debt to GDP ratio and uh, part of the reason for the Greek debt crisis in 2011 was that it, it came out that Greece's debt to GDP ratio, its actual debt to GDP ratio was significantly higher than the number was being, that was being reported. So there are consequences or drawbacks to relying on countries to report their own statistics. And the way around that is to use the data provided by the International Monetary Fund or the IMF or the World Bank. Those are two resources that are seen as extremely reliable. Uh, so that's why I showed you the, the GDP growth rates from the IMF. It's because, I mean, you, you really have a hard time finding more reliable statistics than stuff that comes out from those organizations. Uh, what are SIC codes and NIACS codes? Well, both of these are industry classification codes. Uh, the SIC codes were the, the older codes. So this is a four-digit SIC, a four-digit code. And I mean, what code your firm is in indicates the industry your firm is in. So for example, if we have an SIC code or this firm has an SIC code of 6789, most industry professionals that are familiar with SIC codes would immediately rec recognize that this firm is in the financial services industry. Every firm 
that has an SIC code in the 6,000s is in the financial services industry. NIAC's codes work very similarly. Uh, these, I mean, there's, these are six digit indicators. So here's some examples of some NIAC's codes, uh, but you, know, you can get very granular with these. I mean, if you wanna mention just the, the construction industry, that's a NIAC's code of 23. You want to talk about new multifamily housing construction? That's 236116. Uh, so this is how we segment uh, you know, firms into industries. And this is how we identify industry competitors. If they have the same NIAX code or the same SIC code, chances are they're competing against one another. OK, uh, why do we care about Porter's Five Forces? Pretty simple. I mean. Quite frankly, we don't want to be investing in firms in an industry that doesn't have good barriers to entry. I mean, we want to make sure that the firms in a particular industry, I mean, they they have some agency, they have some power. They, you know, they have the ability to negotiate with their suppliers. They have the ability to negotiate with their buyers. There's no way for new market entrants to come in and uh upset the entire industry. I mean, I, I think the best example of this I could give besides the buggy whip industry, which I gave in class would be the retail industry. I mean, the retail industry, uh, sorry, the in-person retail industry, the firms like uh, Macy's, JCPenney, Sears, they, they sell clothes. Well, nowadays, I mean, not a lot of people wanna go and try on clothes in the store. So, I mean, they're losing out to online retailers. And I mean, quite frankly, there are very low barriers to entry there. I mean, if you have a website, you can sell clothes. I mean, that would be an industry where there's, I mean, there's good substitute products or there's, I mean, there's low barriers to entry. So I would not want to invest in that industry. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, the question or no. Okay, my bad. Oh, no, sorry, I saw, saw the hand raise. <laughs> my bad. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Make sure you're able to use the ratio formulas. Oh, shoot. Uh, I, I won't be giving the ratio formulas on the exam. So uh, if you want the ratio formulas, write them down yourself. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm not giving them is because, well, quite frankly, it's, uh, it's, kind of difficult to put ratios in uh, in the actual canvas as you know you might have seen. So you know just go ahead and uh, <laughs> write those down yourselves. I'm gonna stick to the, the the more important ratios that I mentioned in class. I'm not gonna throw you, you know, just ratios that I barely talked about if, if that does anything. So uh, so big focus on interpretation. Uh, next, why do investors focus so much on the PE ratio? Well, it's because this is one of our best measures of valuation. I mean, it tells us how much investors are willing to pay for a dollar of current earnings per share or expected earnings per share if we're talking about the forward PE ratio. So the higher this PE ratio is, the more valuable the firm is or the, the higher the, the firm the investors believe earnings per share will grow in the future. So for example, if you look at Netflix's PE ratio, I mean, that thing should be in the hundreds still because investors believe there's a lot of growth there. Uh, if you look at, oh, say uh, GM or uh, Toyota's PE ratio, it's gonna be a lot lower because investors recognize there's not gonna be as much growth in terms of earnings there. I mean, they're, they're not as willing to pay a high price for a dollar of current earnings per share. Oh, and then also, uh, lastly, can you read a common size balance sheet and common size income statement? Oh, hopefully. Uh, basically, you know, if I give you a common size balance sheet or a common size income statement or line items from those, can you use them to compare a series of firms? So common size balance sheets, everything is divided by total assets. So all of the numbers are going to be somewhere between zero and 100%. And common size income statements, you're scaling everything by total sales revenue. So again, everything is going to be 
uh, between zero and 100 percent. Or I guess it, it, it could be negative. You have negative net income, for example. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, last chapter is obviously chapter eight. Uh, what is the goal of stock valuation for an investor? Well, quite frankly, uh, the goal of stock valuation is to identify undervalued securities, hands down. I mean, this is this is why we do it. We want to find stocks that are undervalued and hope that those stocks, over time, their market price will appreciate to their intrinsic value. And the intrinsic value is what we calculate using uh, the the methods that I covered in this chapter. So market multiples, uh, the Gordon growth model, the perpetuity model, the two-stage discounted cash flows model. All four of these models are used to calculate intrinsic value. And then we compare intrinsic value to the market price. So depending on uh, the relationship, we either buy or we short. Uh, what determ determines the intrinsic value of a stock? Uh, many factors, but the two big factors are going to be uh, cash flows and the discount rate. And just throw that up here. Oh, shoot, all right. Yeah, so. Our, our discounted cash flows model basically looks like this. I mean, the price of a stock should be equal to its future cash flows. So free cash flow next year, free cash flow two years from now, free cash flow the year after that, all the way out into perpetuity, divided by or discounted at one plus the some discount rate for a period of time. Or for example, if we're uh, if we have free cash flow in year two, we're discounting this by our discount rate or one plus our discount rate for two periods. So our, our uh, discount factor is one plus our discount rate squared. Uh, so that's how we calculate the intrinsic value. We essentially find models that will approximate this. The drawback, however, is that there are some cases where we can't estimate cash flows accurately. And I know I've given a couple of good examples of the, that in class, uh, but I mean, cases where the firm hasn't turned a profit yet, or it's likely not going to turn a profit in the near future, so it's free cash flows are negative. Uh, if the firm, let's say, has really volatile cash flows that we can't estimate, or let's say its growth rate is too high, or I mean, any number of factors, could cause us to not be able to use just uh, a, a cash flow model. In that case, we have to use something like the market multiples approach. And the market multiples approach, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to identify some statistic of our firm. Let's say, Uh, expand this out. So just give you uh, another example to work from. Uh, so uh, stock A has a forward earnings per share of 5.25. Stock B is the stock of a direct competitor of stock A and has a forward E, e ratio of 10.25 and a, well, let's say a price to book of uh, 3.25. Okay, so here's an example of something you might see on the exam. Uh, so we have a stock that we're trying to value, and we only have enough information to use the market multiples approach. Uh, 
the most important component of market multiples is having a direct competitor. The reason being, what we're doing is we're taking some valuation ratio. In this case, we use the forward PE ratio of our direct competitor, and we're copying that or multiplying that by our firm's earnings per share. Uh, the goal here is that we're, we're assuming that these two stocks will grow at the same rate, or they should have the same growth prospects. And so we're really just copying those growth prospects onto the profitability of this firm, stock A. It doesn't always have to be profitability. We might have uh, book price per share. We might have sales per share, but whatever it is, uh, whatever statistic we're multiplying from our target firm has to be in the denominator of our valuation ratio of our competitor. So we have two potential valuation valuation ratios we could use of stock B, but the only one we could use to value stock A is the one that has the forward earnings per share in the denominator. And that's that's going to be the forward PE ratio. So the intrinsic value of stock A here is going to be estimated by 5.25 times the 10.25 PE ratio of stock B. So we have a, an intrinsic share price of $53.81. Uh, definitely, definitely, definitely do not use the price to book in this kind of scenario because notice here the, the denominator of this price to book ratio doesn't match up to earnings per share. Uh, so you're, you couldn't use it. Okay, uh, what are the pros and cons of the market multiples approach? I think I had a, a specific slide for this, but uh, just to summarize, I mean, oh, well, here we go. Uh, the benefit of market multiples is, is it's really good when you can't estimate cash flows. That's the big benefit. If you don't have cash flow information or you don't trust cash flow information, use market multiples. Uh, there are some drawbacks, however. So, for example, uh, some firms manage their earnings. So, they engage in uh, a technique called earnings management, which I, I think I talked about in the, the lecture video. But this occurs when uh, a firm manipulates its accrual accounts. So, it might manipulate its, uh, let's say, accounts receivable during a quarter just to be able to meet a certain analyst expected earnings per share or maybe meet some, some other statistics. Basically, earnings management, while it is legal, it does alter the, the earnings per share of a firm in a given quarter. Uh, so some firms manage their earnings more so than others. Uh, so some firms might choose to change their, let's say their inventory management system from LIFO to FIFO, for example, to, uh, to increase their earnings per share in a given quarter. Uh, that, that would be another example of earnings management. There are literally thousands of these techniques that can be used. Uh, another concern is that uh, some firms, uh, they'll have different uh, fiscal years. So some firms choose to have a, a calendar fiscal year. So their, their year ends on December 31st. Uh, I showed you guys Visa in class, and Visa's fiscal year ends on September 30th. So, I mean, that's a, a, a case where you know, it, it's a little different. Uh, also, I mean, quite frankly, I mean, it's it, market multiples. If you don't, if you don't have the, the perfect comparable firm, your valuation is going to be way off. I mean, there are some industry competitors that I wouldn't use, even though they're in the same industry. I, I wouldn't use them in the market multiples approach. I mean, if American Express is investing more in blockchain technology than Visa, I probably would not want to use it as a direct competitor in my market multiples approach. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, you can use all these valuation ratios to estimate the intrinsic value. So every single one of these, if you've got some, whatever is in the denominator here, you can use the market multiples approach. Okay, uh, 
what are the percent of sales and line item approaches? Uh, and what are the drawbacks of each? Okay, so the percent of sales method in the uh, two stage discounted cash flows model is a method where, let me, actually, better yet, let me show you the, uh, the spreadsheet from our chapter eight material, just because, I mean, that, that's a pretty good example of uh, uh, the percent of sales approach. So there are a couple of ways to use the two-stage discounted cash flows model, which is one of the four models that I discussed. It's easily the most complicated. And I mean, this would be something if we, if I was teaching a valuation class, I would spend, oh, a significant portion of the class on. Uh, so here is one of our two-stage discounted cash flows models. We have some inputs up at the top. So I had to make some assumptions. And then over here, I, Notice that we have historical financial statement data, and then we have pro forma financial statement data, meaning that these are all estimates of uh, revenue for this firm, which is Macy's. And notice that the way we estimate the sales revenue is by adjusting from the sales revenue by one plus uh, a sales growth rate. So we assume that sales will grow by a certain rate. And then usually everything, every line item under sales revenue will grow by uh, something similar. So we're using these, these pro forma sales to drive the growth in all of our other line items. And then we calculate free cash flows based on that. So that's one of the methods that we use to, to estimate or forecast uh, growth in the two-stage discounted cash flows model. The other method is, I mean, I, I dub it the line item method, and that's where you, you literally go line item by line item and try to accurately estimate, okay, if uh, this firm had a uh, cost of revenue of 15 billion this year, uh, based on all of what I've read, that should be 18 billion this year. You're, you're essentially doing a one-off analysis for every line item on the balance on the income statement and balance sheet. And that is incredibly tedious and I don't recommend it. Uh, but those are the two pro, uh, uh, methods for forecasting growth in the two-stage discounted cash flows model. Uh, another model that you should expect to see is the perpetuity model. That's the third of our four models. And the perpetuity model, I mean, that really is the simplest of all models that I could possibly give you. So. Uh, there's really only a couple of different assets or one in particular that we value using the perpetuity model, and that is preferred stock. Okay, so here's an example of you know, something I'm, I might ask with respect to preferred stocks. So uh, preferred stock pays a dividend of 310 per year. Hopefully you're, you're aware that preferred stock, it, the only benefit here is that you get a dividend. That dividend gets paid, I mean, in, in reality, it gets paid every quarter, but just to simplify, I'm saying per year. Uh, so there's no growth in that dividend whatsoever. If you demand a 15% return, in other words, you have a, a required return of 15%, uh, what is the intrinsic value of this asset? I should say to you. But all we're doing here is, I mean, this is the no growth case. And all we're doing is just taking 310 divided by 0.15. It's the dividend or cash flow 
divided by the, the discount rate, or as we refer to it in valuation, the, the required return. Uh, so in this case, our intrinsic value is $20 and about 67 cents. That's how we use the, the, per, the perpetuity model, uh, simplest of all models. Uh, Gordon growth model, also known as the dividend growth model. I think your, your book referred to it as the dividend growth model. Uh, just for simplicity, just because sometimes we use free cash flows in it, I, I've tried to use the, the phrase Gordon growth model because, I mean, it's named after the researcher that developed it, obviously last name Gordon. Uh, but this model is one where we assume that there's a constant growth rate in your cash flow, in your dividend. Uh, so let me give you an example. Try to make it a little very, we'll say very complicated. Uh, so. And this, so I'll try and give you just the most complicated example I can, just so you know you've, you've seen everything. Uh, uh, so yield on the one-year T-bill is two point five percent. Uh, let's say okay so here i mean i've i tried to make this a little more difficult than i otherwise would but you know since i only going over one example here let's let's up the difficulty so uh we have a uh, stock with an ROE of 11%. I'll just put the information here. Uh, we have, we know our beta is 1.5. That's our measure of market risk. We know the yield on the T-bill is 2.5%. The T-bill rate is always our, our uh, risk-free rate. And so that's going to be 2.5%. Market risk premium. Uh, that's going to be used when we try to estimate our required return. Uh, and our payout ratio is 15%. And our dividend next year is, I'm sorry, our free cash flow next year is uh, $14.50. Okay, so uh, how do we solve this? Well, the Gordon growth model says that, go here to the, so this is our Gordon growth model. It's our constant growth model. Uh, it says that if we want to calculate the intrinsic value or the price of a stock, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our dividend or cash flow today multiply it by one plus the growth rate and divide that all by our, our discount rate or our, our required rate of return uh, minus our growth rate. And notice here that we have another formula or another component here, D1. D1 is equal to D0 times one plus G. It's essentially the dividend one year from today is equal to the dividend today times one plus our growth rate. Uh, so we actually already have this, this is that $14.50. The growth rate, we're going to have to estimate using the uh, ROE 
and the payout ratio. And then this R, this we're going to use the cap M for. OK, so let's get started. I'll put the information over here. So our growth rate, G, is going to be, I mean, if we want to estimate this, we're not explicitly given a growth rate. You might be given an explicit growth rate on the exam, but if you're not, uh, there is a way to estimate a growth rate. And the way we do that is by recognizing that, I mean, if this firm is only paying out 15% of its net income each year, the remaining 85% is remaining at the firm and potentially being reinvested to earn an 11% return. It's being reinvested in new capital budgeting projects, which means that the firm's future cash flow should be growing. And so in, in the lectures, I, I gave you the formula to estimate the, the internal growth rate of the firm as being our ROE times one minus the payout ratio. So this is, I mean, if you wanted to estimate a growth rate, an internal growth rate, this is how you would do it. Uh, the reason being you have a certain amount of cash that's being reinvested and earning this return. So our, our internal growth rate is 9.35%. Our required return try to avoid getting the trademark symbol. Oh good. Uh, this we're going to use the, the cap M for. And the capital asset pricing model is just our risk-free rate plus our beta times our market risk premium. It's as simple as that. Uh, so that's R, and we know our D1 is 14.5. And so our intrinsic value is just our dividend at the end of the year divided by our required return minus our growth rate. And our intrinsic value here is 674.42 per share. So that's that. Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, just a couple final uh, questions. And I think what I what we have left is probably the, the most difficult stuff. Uh, so pros and cons of the discounted cash flows models that we discussed in class or in the video, there are some massive drawbacks to the uh, to the, the dividend discount model or the Gordon growth model. Uh, the first Big one is that, I mean, let me see if I can find it here so I can explicitly state it as I talk about it. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to remember where I put this, but uh, failing miserably. Well, I'll just talk about the model. Uh, there are some drawbacks to the Gordon growth model, the, the dividend discount model. First, your growth rate cannot be larger than your required return. If it is, you're going to get a negative valuation, which theoretically is is not possible. You you wouldn't want uh, you wouldn't want to see that, and that would mean that your your model is, I mean, is not something you wouldn't want to use that projection. Uh, also. You're assuming a constant growth rate in dividends, which in the real world is absolutely not realistic. I mean, it's it's just firms don't grow by 3% every year. They don't grow their dividends by 3% every single year. So this model, it's entirely unrealistic, which is why in the real world, if you use this model, I mean, most of your valuations will just not be accurate at all. I mean, this is downside to valuation. There is no perfect valuation model. The best we do is 
we estimate a range of valuations and hopefully get close. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the Gordon growth model. Uh, can you value a stock given the data for a simple two-stage discounted cash flows model? Okay, so now we're looking at the most difficult type of question I could conceivably ask you. Uh, so let's go through this. So Stock. Okay. Uh, let's bring this over here. Let's change it up. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we have these. Free cash flows to equity, meaning that this is the cash flow that uh, has not been invested in capital budgeting projects or uh, used to pay the interest payments or the coupon payments on the firm's debt. This is just cash flow that could go to the the share the shareholders. And we also know that our G is three uh, percent, and our are our market cap rate or our required rate of return is 12%. So how do we solve this? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to estimate the value of <clears throat> all of its future cash flows after year three. And the way we do that is, I mean, we know that those cash flows are going to grow by 3% rate or rather we're assuming those cash flows are gonna grow by a 3% rate forever. So what we have to use is the uh, Gordon growth model to estimate the terminal value cash flows. And here we're just using the Gordon growth model to do this. And the value that we're gonna get is going to give us the, the value of all those future cash flows after year three discounted back to year three because i mean here we have our our cash flow in year three times one plus our growth rate divided by r minus g it's just our gordon growth model and so our, our terminal value is two thousand two hundred and eighty eight dollars There we go. Okay. So now what we can do is we can actually, uh, well, we can change this up. I mean, we, we have all of our cash flows. If we wanted to, we could simplify this by summing them all up. But our goal is now that we have our cash flows, we need to discount them back to the present. We need to discount this $150 cash flow in year one back to the present at this 12% rate. We need to discount this total $300 cash flow from year two back to the present at the 12% rate. And we also need to discount the total cash flow in year three, this value, back to the present over th uh, at this 12% rate. And the way to do this is, I mean, this is where your, your BA2 calculator is going to come in handy. 
so why don't I uh, pull this up and show you how to use this? Or rather, just refresh your memory on how to use this, uh, since you hopefully use this in uh, in uh, Finance 300 and you might have used it on the last exam. All right, so the way you're going to use your BA2 calculator to solve something like this would be to use the cash flows button or the CF button. So if I hit the CF button, uh, my CF zero, that represents the cash flow today or at time period zero, that's just zero. I mean, we're going to leave that as is and hit the down arrow. C01 is our total cash flow in time period one, and that's 150. Put one five zero and I want to lock that in by hitting enter and you'll notice that it's locked in because you'll see this, uh, this triangle here and the equal sign so hit the down arrow frequency of cash flow one that's one we'll leave it the same Hit the down arrow c02 that's our cash flow in year two and it's 300 300 and hit enter to lock it in hit the down arrow f02 is one C03, just enter our 2488, and I'll round that to 0.89 and hit enter. And I mean, our default for the frequency of that cash flow is one. Uh, and then we go to the NPV function and set our discount rate. Our discount rate is going to be 12%. So this is this I. Here, this is in percentage terms, so I'll just hit enter after I enter the 12, hit the down arrow, and hit compute. And this NPV, this is the intrinsic value of this stream of cash flows. This is the intrinsic value of this stock, about 21,000 or 20, $2,445. Uh, that is on the extreme end of what I, I could ask you to, to calculate. Uh, basically, can you use the two-stage discounted cash flows model in, in a very simplified way? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, as I sit here, I'm trying to think of other questions I could reasonably ask you. Uh, the one that I left out, and I, I'm embarrassed that I forgot to mention this, uh, can you calculate the cap M given data? I mean, that of all the questions you're you're uh, reasonably likely to see. I mean, I'd say in terms of quantitative questions, uh, yeah, you're you're absolutely going to get a a cap M question. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, draw up a, a cap M question. Uh, so. Uh, so I guess I yeah, will use a different number, 4.5%. Right, so here's an example of you know, uh, a cap M question that I, I might reasonably ask you. So uh, we have our beta. And that's 0.91. That's, I mean, Visa's current beta, just for reference. Uh, so this would be technically a, a defensive stock. Uh, we know our risk-free rate, RF, is 4.5%. And we know that our return on the S&P 500 is 12%. Well, that return on the S&P 500, that's our return on the market, or that's going to be our, rather, our expected return on the market. Uh, so with the cap M, I mean, what we're really looking at here, I guess I want, I'm 
this out right here. Uh, I mean, we have all the necessary information to solve this. We know our risk-free rate is 4.5%. Our beta is 0.91. Our expected return on the market is 12-ish. Uh, yeah, so 12%. And so we can solve the expected return as just the risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. And our market risk premium is just the expected return on the market minus risk-free rate. Probably have to close parentheses. Let me uh, let me actually move this down just so you can see what it's pulling. Uh, so there we go. There we go. Our expected return is 11.33%. And uh, yeah, so I, it, that notice here, and I, I know I said it in class and I, I tried to say it as many times as I could, but I, I guarantee you if I look at the, the exam results, I'll, I'll bet you at least a third of the class misses it for this very simple reason. Uh, this entire thing inside the parentheses is the market risk premium. Uh, notice that I didn't give you the ex explicitly the market risk premium. I gave you the expected return on the S&P 500. That's just the expected return on the market. So uh, depending on whether I give you the, the expected return on the S&P 500 or the complete market risk premium, that's gonna change your, your calculation. I, I promise you, a massive number of students will miss that on the exam. Don't let it be you. Uh, be very careful in noting whether I gave you the expected return on the market or the market risk premium. That'll, that'll make your, your life a lot easier. Shoot, I, I think I, I think I got everything. I mean, I, so I've, I, I've written the, the rough draft version of our exam. I still need to review it, but I, I mean, yeah, I tried to hit everything that you know I, I reasonably could ask you. I might do some alterations with the exam, but I mean, quite frankly, uh, based on what you saw in terms of quantitative questions, I, I don't think I'm throwing anything out of left field. I mean, if you saw it on an assignment, I, I would say that that would mean it's probably fair game. I'm obviously not asking you to collect any real world data. Uh, but the best approximation of what you're likely to see will come from the quantitative questions on the assignments. And then also, uh, yeah, I mean, any, if, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the next best thing is going to be this, this draft or this document that I have for you. I mean, that's when I wrote the exam, I, I literally just looked at this document. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, oh, and I, I will, because I, I know I made a mistake. Uh, saying that I, I was going to give the formulas on the exam. I'll change that up. I'll, I'll update this document on the on the uh, Canvas site, and I'll send an announcement just to tell people I you won't have the formulas on the exam. You'll need to write down any formulas. But uh, yeah, just, just be aware you won't have any formulas on the exam. Uh, but if you're looking for some good formulas, I'd say these would be about the best ones that you could write down. I guess I need to update that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, any any final questions for me? By chance? Yeah, please. So for the lockdown browser, I know for the first exam you had us do like a little practice quiz thingy. Is there like another one of those that we're doing for this exam, or is it like kind of knew how to use it last time, so we should be good now? I think. I mean, you should be good. I mean, if you'd like to test the lockdown, do the lockdown browser again, uh, test again, please be my guest. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm not going to force you to do anything else besides just take the exam this time. Okay. And then for like the calculators, is it okay if we have like, like I'm not super good with the BA too. Like this is my first year using it. So I have, what is it called? Uh, 
like this one, the TI-84. Oh, is it okay if I have like this one for like general calculations and then the VA one for like when we actually need to use it for like the cap M and stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, definitely whatever calculator you want to use is perfectly fine. The only reason I mentioned the VA2 or recommend it is because of those cash flow buttons. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I guess uh, I think I've wasted uh, enough of your time. <laughs> I guess I'll uh, let you off of here before it gets too late. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, any follow-up questions, uh, obviously reach out. I mean, got enough time. <laughs>